friends. Hardly enough, the best way to give you some idea of what we are talking about tonight is to give you the definition of a prune. A prune is a worried plum. <laughs> so I'm going to say something about worry, or more properly, about fear. A little girl went to her daddy once and said, Daddy, are you afraid of cows? No. Are you afraid of snakes? No. Are you afraid of long woolly worms? No. Daddy, you aren't afraid of anything but mom, are you? <laughs> well, what is fear that so much concerns our modern world? Fear, actually, is related to love, as all the passions are. And fear is the emotion that arises in us when there is a danger facing something or someone that we love. And the mother has fear for her children. We will talk about various kinds of fear. First of all, fears in the ego and then fears outside of the ego, but principally dealing with effects. One could give the kinds of fears. Now, first of all, in the ego or in the self. One of the first effects of fears, and this seems very strange, is laziness. Well, how is laziness related to fear? Well, a person so loves his own physical comfort and ease that he's afraid of work. Very simple. I heard of, a, of an old couple down south. The husband was leaning up against the house, facing out into the road. The wife was in a rocker, but she was facing the house in the porch. And she said, what's that noise out in front? He said, that's Jim McComb's funeral going by. Many added, yes. He said, about 20 hacks. My, she said, I'd love to see that funeral. I wish I was turned around the other way. <laughs> then... Another effect of fear is gambling. Here I'm speaking of professional gamblers. A professional gambler is one who is afraid of the responsibilities of life. And so he lives in a world of fantasy and dream in which he's always just about to make a great fortune. Two of them were coming home from the racetrack one day and one of them said, you know, today I broke even. And boys that I needed. <laughs> Another is effect of fear is hypochondria. Uh, there are some people who make themselves mentally sick. Actually, there are cases on record, for example, of men saying, you know, if I had not been sick, I would have been one of the greatest tennis players in America. Or if I had not been sick, I would have written the finest novel that was ever produced in America. Or if I were not sick, I would have been a millionaire and so forth. Now, it's very likely that he became sick, made himself really sick, in order to avoid facing the responsibility of his own boast. In the San Francisco earthquake, there were 30 people who hadn't walked in 30 years, got up and walked. <laughs> then another effect of fear is um, lying. Some who have a feeling of deep inferiority discover that by boastfulness and exaggeration that they uh, convince others of their importance. I know of a little girl who was always lying. She was given a St. Bernard dog once. I once had a St. Bernard dog. He had the instinct of a lap dog and the instep of a rhinoceros. <laughs> well, this little girl was given a St. Bernard dog, and she went out and told all the neighbors she had been given a lion. And her mother called her and said, Now, listen, I told you not to lie. 
You go upstairs, tell God you're sorry. Promise God that you will not lie again. So she went upstairs and said her prayers, and when she came down, the mother said, did you say your prayers, and did you tell God you were sorry? And the little girl said, yes, I did. And God said that sometimes he finds it hard to tell a dog from a lion. <laughs> Then another effect is what is called shamefacedness or red facedness, embarrassing moments. Take, for example, the woman taken in adultery mentioned in the gospel. Here there is a fear of having one's reputation and honor either destroyed or exploited. I once knew of a man who was seated next to a very charming lady at a banquet table. He had just met her at the table. And for want of something better to say, he saw someone in the far end of the room whom he knew. And calling the attention of the lady, he said, um, see that man down there? Yes, said the lady. He said, you know, I hate him. And she in righteous indignation said, I beg to tell you that is my husband. And he said, Madam, that's why I hate him. <laughs> Not everybody gets out of difficulties quite so easily. Now, these are the effects of fear in the ego. What happens to us? Now, there are other effects of fear because of what happens to us. Take, for example, something that happens to us because of its magnitude. Sunset in the Mediterranean, the sight of the Alps, or the two infinities that always made Pascal wonder, the infinitely little and the infinitely great. The effect of magnitude is to create in one wonder. Wonder is the beginning of all philosophy. Aristotle tells us that. It's the beginning of all philosophy because it makes us ask, no, my angel needn't bother now uh, washing away this because I, I suppose he wondered why we got over here, but we got a little signal to move. I was facing the wrong camera. Then another effect of fear is when something is very unexpected. Think, for example, the explosion of an atomic bomb and or something unexpected that's happening to me now. These two clocks are not exactly alike and I'm wondering just on what second I'm going to finish. So if you'll give me a signal. <laughs> So, will the angel flutter around me and tell me sometime which clock I'm to follow? <laughs> Such as the explosion of an atomic bomb creates stupor. And the third effect, and this is very important, is where there is something that happens to us in which we feel helpless. And that creates what is known as anxiety. There is a tremendous disproportion between our own resources and the hostile forces that oppose us. This anxiety is rather normal, particularly in the physical order. And here we leave these old descriptions of, they are very old. I might tell you that I got all of this out of a book that was 700 years old. But there's a new kind of anxiety. And now I'm just a little anxious about my 
Angel cleaning my blackboard, and as soon as he does, I will come back to you to tell you about the new kind of anxiety. This new kind of anxiety is very modern. And it is the anxiety with which uh, many psychiatrists and psychoanalysts deal. It is an anxiety that is rather abnormal than normal. The normal anxiety is something that makes us afraid because of what happens on the outside, that is to say, outside of us. The abnormal anxiety, and this is the very modern one, makes us fear because of something that happens inside of us. The first kind of anxiety is physical. The second kind of anxiety is mental or psychical. These are very normal fears. For example, fright during a thunderstorm, being chased by a bull on the farm, danger of being struck in traffic. But the new anxieties are coming from the inside of man in himself, from whence they should never come. The result is too many modern minds are very much like this. This is the conscious part of their existence, and down here is the unconscious, and the unconscious is seething with all kinds of repressions. There are even coiled serpents in that unconscious and subconscious mind. They're constantly striving for some kind of release. There are many effects that are produced by this abnormal anxiety or fear, and of them we will mention three. The first is what is known as a compulsion neurosis. Did you ever hear about the woman who lived in a bed of neurosis? I'll give you a minute to get that. First of all, a compulsion neurosis is something that we are forced to do because we have not done what we ought to do. This is one of the very common manifestations of subjective anxiety. I could think of no better way to describe it uh, than to take the description that was given by Shakespeare. You remember the great tragedy of Macbeth? And in that magnificent story, Lady Macbeth encourages her husband to murder the King Duncan while he sleeps in order that he might seize the crown and be the king. When he does it, he's frightened and afraid. Lady Macbeth says to him, Think not on these ways, for they will drive you mad. In other words, do not think of your guilt. Suppress it and repress it. Lady Macbeth then kills the grooms, smears them with her own blood, and she says to Macbeth, now, my hands are your color. But I should shame to wear a heart so white. Making fun of anyone who had a guilty conscience. Lady Macbeth's conscience is asleep while she is awake. There's so many in our world who are constantly repressing the sense of guilt. But while Lady Macbeth sleeps, her conscience is awake. And she walks in her sleep, 
She sees blood in her hands, at least she thinks she does. She says, will not all the perfumes of Arabia sweeten this little hand? Will not great Neptune's oceans wash away these stains? Nay, rather, they will the multitudinous seas incarnadine. turning the green one red. And for a quarter of an hour at a time, she would wash her hands. That was a compulsion neurosis, coming from the fear of punishment because of the guilt of murder. Instead of purifying her conscience, the compulsion neurosis came out in the washing of the hands, as it does in so many compulsion neuroses in our modern world. That's the first effect. And the second effect of this wrong subjective fear and anxiety is terror. Terror is the fear that comes from being terrorized. Terror is something that seizes the persecutor. Whenever you find a man who has been cruel to others, he always lives in terror. I was talking to one of the greatest artists in the world and I asked him when he came to America, what he considered the most interesting, interesting face in America that he saw. And he mentioned the name of the then representative of the Soviet Union and the United Nations. He said, his face intrigues me. If I were painting it, I should paint a skull. And we know that some of their representatives, when they leave our hotels in New York, leave sometimes their guns under the pillows, bullets in the night tables. Terror. Terror because they know they have taken the lives of many and have been responsible and there's no blotting out a guilty conscience though they deny both God and conscience and morality. And then finally there is horror, this modern thing of horror, or rather dread, Red is the fear of nothing. Think of how many there are in our world today who have no sense whatever of a plan of life. They are, if I may describe it, something like this. I'm telling you what, I'm, this is a ship. This is a, uh, a mast to the ship. This is the water of the ship. This is a crow's nest. No respectable crow would ever be seen in it either. <laughs> and. That's the ladder going up to it, and here's my usual man, the only kind of man that I can draw. I'll get another art scholarship for this one. The modern man does not know where he's going. He's not certain of his destiny. This is a storm at sea, and he's always in danger of being thrown back into the nothingness from which he came. And so he lives in a terrible sense of dread. He's fearing the wrong things, our modern man. And much of modern culture is destined to try and suppress that dread. Sleeping tablets, opiates, constant love of pastime and pleasures, all these are attempted to suppress this awful gnawing feeling of nothingness and the dread of nothingness. Why is it that a cow never has dread? Pig never has a psychosis. A hen never has a neurosis. Why is it none of these things have dread? simply because none of these things in lower creation, nothing below man has a soul. It was born for the infinite. It takes eternity to make a man despair. And if they only knew it, as I said, they're fearing the wrong things. We used to fear God, then we began to fear fellow man. And now, we begin to fear what? We begin to fear ourselves, something that we should never fear. How will they get out of it? They will get out of it by realizing that fear is the pathway to peace. But there are two kinds of fear. There's the servile fear and there's a filial fear. Servile fear is a fear of punishment, which they all have, a fear of judgment. 
The filial fear is the fear of reverence. For example, servile fear. The child disobeys the mother and goes to the mother and said, Mommy, I'm sorry I, I did wrong. Now I can't go to the picnic, can I? And the other child just throws her arms around the mother's neck and cries and, and said, Mommy, I'm sorry I hurt you. Servile fear or the fear of punishment or the dread can be the starting point for filial fear or the fear of reverence. All who have dread have within themselves a longing. They all have misery. What they need and what they want is mercy. And if therefore they will face love itself or perfect love casts out fear, then they will come indeed to someone whom they will love so much that they will be honest and good and just, not because they dread punishment, but simply because they have reverence for someone whom they love. No one will ever be good over a long period of time. Simply because he's told to keep a law, he will be good only because he would not to want to hurt someone that he loves. Why be good? Because there comes to one the sight of wounded hands and ridden feet. It comes to one a picture who has, of one who has been hurt. And so we try to be good because we love God and we love him so much we do not want to hurt him. That is the end of fear. God love you.